We're in Nehemiah. Turn there with me. We're in chapters 4, 5, and 6. Last week we started this message. We ran out of time, so we put it on pause. So let me do a little review with us. Go get your outline out there. Talking about Nehemiah protects. Talking about proceeding in the face of opposition to accomplish the will of God. It's difficult to proceed when opposition is there, but we know we have to. So we simply obey God and move on. Last week we looked at opposition attacked the workers and they attacked them verbally. And you remember their goal, right? Their goal was simple prevent. The wall from being rebuilt. They had a purpose and a mission statement, just like you do at your place of business. Then we talked about the opposition attacks the workers physically. I spent some time talking about the job of leadership is to keep hope alive. We talked about that. And then we spent some time on the word enthusiasm, which means God literally in you. I think you got most of those from last week. So this week, part two, we want to look at opposition attacks the leader, and we want to look at verses 15 and 16 in chapter 5. Here it says, but the earlier governors, those preceding me, placed a heavy burden on the people and took 50 shekels of silver from them in addition to the food and wine. Their assistants also lorded it over the people. But out of reverence for God, I did not act like that. Instead, I devoted myself to the work on this wall. All my men were assembled there for the work. We did not acquire any land. Furthermore, 150 Jews and officials ate at my table. I fell. As well as those who came from us, came to us from surrounding nations. Each day, he said, let me take my grocery bill. Each day, one ox, six choice sheep, and some poultry were prepared for me, and every ten days, an abundant supply of wines of all kinds. In spite of all this, I never demanded the food allotted for the governor, because the demands were heavy on the people. In the fifth chapter, Nehemiah defends his rights to the poor. And parenthetically, let me say, if you know you're going to serve the Lord, it always involves caring for the poor, right? Always. You can't get away from that. I know somebody that said one time, I want to have a church for the up and out, not the down and out. That's not the way it works. And shame on us for thinking like that. It always involves the poor. The Bible in many places condemns showing favoritism because people have money, right? Condemns that. And if we're not careful, we fall into that same old trap. See, the devil doesn't have any new traps. They're all the same old traps he's been using for six or 7,000 years and we fall into them again and again. The Bible condemns that. It doesn't matter to me if you give $5 or $5,000 or $500,000 to this church. You are valued in God's eyes. And we love you. We want to care for you. Why? Because God created you. And in Waldrop, we say this often, Jesus cares about people. Now we'll add the last part, not money. Jesus cares about people. Get involved in those, in defending those less fortunate than yourself. And if you ask somebody if they're rich, nobody ever says they're rich. Yes, you have $20 million to be rich. No, I'm not rich. That's because you're comparing yourself to somebody else. But stop and think, well, is there anybody in here that's not rich? I mean, don't you have like food in your refrigerator at home? Don't you have some gas in your car? I mean, don't, don't you have some clothes that you didn't wear today? I know, you go to the closet, there's only two racks of clothes, but I don't have a thing to wear. I understand it. But understand, we are the rich. That's us. So get involved with those less fortunate. It is, an, it is a godly act. And the Bible says that my God shall supply all your needs. And then he gives how. It doesn't say from the Bank of England. It doesn't say from the Nations Bank. It says according to his riches in Christ Jesus. Now that's the best place to have riches. 
That's where moth and thieves and dust, all that stuff doesn't operate and corrupt and steal. So the opposition now begins to attack Nehemiah in several ways. First, it tries to sidetrack his efforts. Look with me what the Bible says here. When the word came to Sanballat, to buy Gershom the Arab, and the rest of our enemies, that I had rebuilt the wall, and not a gap was left in it, though up to that time I had not set the doors and the gates, Sanballat and Gershom sent this message to me. Come, let us meet together in one of the villages on the plain of Ono. But they were scheming to harm me. So I sent messengers to them with this reply. I am carrying on a great project and cannot go down. Why should the work stop while I leave and go down to you? Four times they sent me the same message. Each time I gave them the same answer. Look back at verse 2. Sam Valley and Gershom sent me this message. Come, let us meet together. Come, let us meet together. Come, let us meet together. Come, let us meet. You're getting tired of hearing it, right? That's how many times he had to hear it. I mean, they just kept going back to him. The reply was the same. No. Verse 4, he says, Four times they sent this message to me. Each time I gave them the same answer. So we know that I'm carrying on this great work. Cannot come down. <laughs> Excuse me. Can you imagine... What would happen to the preacher if he didn't go to every meeting? Who does he think he is not coming to this meeting? This meeting's important. We're discussing which life goals need to be changed. You know, we have meetings like that in our go to. Can you imagine the pastor saying, I'm carrying on a great project and cannot come to hell to meet with you? Can I tell you a secret, sense of teachers? You cannot meet the needs of all your class members. I mean, I know you're good, but you're not that good. Every now and then I'll go and preach revival, and I do a lot of Sunday school emphasis in those revivals, and I'm always asking people, why do you want a large class? Jesus, the master teacher, only had 12. So if you've got 25, you think you're like twice as good as Jesus. They don't like it when you start saying that because I've built the biggest class in the church. You know, that kind of thing. But let me assure you, you can't meet all those needs. But some expect you to. When you realize this, you begin to get others help you in your class to carry the load. Then ministry really starts to happen. Let me encourage you to get a prayer coordinator. Let me encourage you to get some care group leaders. Let me encourage you to get a fellowship leader. Let me encourage you to get those kinds of people in your class that structure so those things are happening. An outreach leader, every class needs those workers. Truth is, I cannot care for the needs of every member of Walter every day. That's why I have deacons. That's why I have Sunday school teachers. However, sometimes they expect the pastor, you know, the deacons will go by and say, raise your label, they won't you. But what if you're having surgery the same day three other people are having surgery at different hospitals? Same time. Right? Uh, we, we had a funeral here a few months ago, and I stood in the foyer with another pastor. And he said he had 52 funerals the year before that. And then, like, one week, what's the chance they were all on Mondays? None. You know there were three some weeks in the day. Can you imagine if you had three the same day? I mean, that happens sometimes. You just can't be everywhere at the same time. You know that. So they get disappointed in the pastor and they start to ridicule the pastor. But here's what I want you to know. I'm going to let you if you talk good about it. I'm going to let you talk nice about it. I prefer the nice, but, but I understand both come with the job. But we are doing a great work here at Waldron. We believe God has called us to reach this city that means see sinners saved and then see those sinners who are saved discipled and developed in becoming Christ followers that will follow Him even if you quit. Even if I quit. They want to follow Jesus because He is the Lord. I cannot. You cannot. We cannot leave this great work that God has called us to. Sometimes attacks come verbally. 
Some of these attacks might become physical. You know, there have been churches where people went in and shot people, have attacked them. Some churches have been bombed. Let me tell you, the devil will use anybody. He will. But then he moves on. They tried to intimidate him personally. Look at verse 5. Then the fifth time, right? Aren't you getting a little tired of them coming to him? The fifth time, Sam Allen sent an aid to me with the same message in his hand in an unsealed letter in which was written, It is reported among the nations, and Gershom says it's true. Now, don't you like that little phrase? We know this is happening, but Sister So-and-So says it's true. Well, then, if Sister So-and-So says it, that settles it. Or Brother So-and-So says it, that settles it. Gershom says it's true. That you and the Jews are plotting to revolt. And therefore, you are building the wall. Moreover, according to the reports, you are about to become their king. Now, this is treason. This is serious stuff. And have even appointed prophets to make this proclamation about you in Jerusalem. There is a king in Judah... Now this report will get back to the king. So come and let us meet together. So we can stop the report from getting back. Come and let us meet together. I sent them this reply. Nothing like what you were saying is happening. You were just making it up out of your head. Isn't the Bible realistic? I mean, doesn't it paint the real story? Verse 9. They were all trying to frighten us, thinking their hands will get too weak for the work, and it will not be completed. But I pray, now strengthen my hands. I like that. Now let's kind of review a little bit of those verses and some high points. They sent him an unsealed letter, and this letter is accusing him of treason. It's an attempt to get him to stop the work. I had somebody tell me recently that they got a phone call. And the phone call said, we are with the United States government. And we are sending agents to your house to arrest you if you don't, it's an IRS thing, if you don't comply and pay this back taxes that you owe off in the amount of $5,000. And we need your credit card number now. And that, that happens today. And the person on the other line said, I wish you would send somebody to my house. <laughs> they were sharp enough to get it. But you know, some people, you can intimidate them and they'll give you their credit card number over the phone. It's scary what goes on out there. Making it up in your head, frightening us. They just want their hands to be too weak for the work. But then he says in verse 9, but I prayed. Now strengthen my hands. Verse 13 says, he had hired, he had been hired to intimidate me. They would give me a bad name to discredit me. You know, it may surprise you that leaders try to People try to intimidate leaders. I have received anonymous phone calls. You know, this is back before cell phones when you could track all the IDs. And we just call you back now. For star 69. But people would call and leave a message and not leave their name and number. Oh, I would guess they just forgot. While they were chewing you out and fussing at you, they forgot to leave their name and number. I actually got uh, several letters one time harassing me. One was very ugly. Didn't have a return address on it. And they forgot to sign it. What's up with that? I've discovered something. The people that send these kind of ugly messages and now I don't know how they do it now, not be tracked with text or use somebody else's phone and get a burner phone, whatever the text you send you ugly stuff. It, it goes back to their character. Here's what I've learned about them. They're cowards. Did you just call them cowards? Yes. Go see the person you have an issue with. Be woman enough, be man enough to stand there and look at him and talk to him. And if you have a disagreement, act like an adult. By that I mean don't go, Ooh. act like an adult. Carry on the conversation with them and say, I have this issue. Can we resolve it? This is what I think we need to do to resolve it. I mean, have some suggestions. And did you hear how I just said that? I have this issue. I don't say, you got a problem, buddy. And you got to fix it. I have an issue. Can we resolve it? You have to talk in those kinds of terms if you want to resolve things. You may not. You may just want to bust some blame. People tried to intimidate leaders. They tried to intimidate Nehemiah. But you know what he did? He prayed. Isn't that a great response? Rather than getting afraid, he just prayed. 
So what I'm telling you is do everything you can in your power to protect, to protect your name and your integrity and pray. And then just let God handle the, where the pieces fall, right? Just let God work that out. My issue is I am impatient. Can I get an amen? And I wanted him to work that out yesterday. I didn't want him to take seven years to work that out. But sometimes God says, uh, what I'm really working on, Mike, is not them, it's you. Oh, and you're so hard-headed. It took me seven years to get you to learn this. I could have done it in a week, but you weren't ready. See how, see how it all comes back? God really is interested in us. He loves us. He cares about us. Now, Adrian Rogers, one of my heroes, great preacher, years past in Memphis, Tennessee, said to us, he said, preach, boys. He said, if they come against you in the spirit, he said, deal with it in the spirit. He said, if they come against you as a man, deal with it as a man. And that was good advice. The enemies of God tried to sidetrack Nehemiah. They tried to intimidate him personally. They went so far as accusing him of treason. And he prayed. Strike two. I mean, they're, they're getting low on strikes now. What are we going to do? So, go to the third thing. One day, I went to the house of Shemaiah, son of Nehiah, the son of Methibel, who was shedding in his home. He said, let us meet in the house of God. Doesn't that sound spiritual? Let's go down to the church. Inside the temple, and let us close the temple doors, because men are coming to kill you. By night, they are coming to kill you. But I said, should a man like me run away? Or should someone like me go into the temple to save his life? I will not go. I realized that God had not sent him, but he had prophesied against me because Tobiah and Sanballat had hired him. Verse 13. He had been hired to intimidate me so that I would commit a sin by doing this, and then they would give me a bad name to discredit. These are pretty slick old boys, aren't they? I mean, they know the strategy of how to defeat their enemies. Now, notice the spiritual way that Nehemiah handles this. I put that quote from them in spiritual, but Nehemiah really did it in the spiritual way. Went down to the house. He said, let us meet in the house of God. Let's just have a short committee meeting. Let's just do it at the church. And they say, you know, Deacon Bob, Deacon Sue, Deacon Joe, Deacon whoever, they're trying to kill you. So let's kind of get inside the fort and close the doors. Get in the temple of God here. Seemingly for Nehemiah's protection, seemingly for your protection, seemingly for mine. But Nehemiah said, why should we run away? And then he gives a little phrase, I realized that God had not sent him. See, that is spiritual insight. Proverbs 1.7 says, The beginning of wisdom is the fear of God. If you fear God, that's the very beginning. But fools despise wisdom and instruction. And y'all, I've been a fool. Hello, haven't you? Haven't you despised some things that God wanted you to learn? I've said no to them. I've been that fool. I, I know. But every now and then He gives you that insight. Because you are fearing Him. You are walking with Him. You just see it for what it is. Nehemiah would not go to their meetings, so they tried intimidation, then they decided just to kill him. They said, well, let's just kill him, and then if the leader's gone, well, the wall won't get rebuilt, we will accomplish our goal. Remember, the goal was to prevent the wall from being rebuilt. Nehemiah here has some divine intervention. He, he just knows that God had not him. How do you know that? It's a God thing. He just speaks to you. You know that. It was a result of Nehemiah being in constant contact and fellowship with God. Now, when you have small children, you have some of these experiences, right? We had a sweet experience with our children one time. I didn't have it, Melinda, and she told me about it. The kids had snuck into the kitchen, got some pecan rolls, a little gun for a thing, and had taken them and were eating them in another room. And when she found them, they had some crumbs around them. She said, have y'all been eating the pecan for us? One of them said, did Jesus take you that? <laughs> See, they know we try to walk with God. I mean, they see us pray. They hear us pray. They know we try to walk with God. Jesus take you that. But Jesus has his way of 
fifth month of driving. <laughs> Nehemiah gets this word from God. Don't go. They're trying to kill you. I didn't send him. So Nehemiah is walking with him. The Bible says, The Lord confides in those who fear him. He makes his covenant known with them. Has God ever confided in you? Has God ever told you what was going on? Giving you some spiritual insight? Nehemiah had an inside track as what was happening. Because Nehemiah walked with the Lord, the Lord protected him and protected God's own people through him. Now, Father's Day's coming up, and, and Dad, we understand this one. Okay? We are the protectors. I don't know how to explain to you women how we're wired, but we're just wired that way. We want to be the protectors. God's put that in us. You know that. So, Dads, let me encourage you to pray. Let me encourage you to fast. Let me encourage you to tithe. Let me encourage you to read the scriptures. You'll be amazed at how much wisdom you get out of this book on how to protect your family. Just do the basics and let God take care of that. It's still a real problem today. And you know, there are people that will get mad at you and will shoot you for looking at them wrong in the car next to you, right? Going down the highway. There's some crazy people out there. You know that. So please stay in, in contact with God. Please walk with Him so that He might reveal to you what's going on. So that He might take you into His confidence. You know, that's a real honor if God ever takes you into His confidence. But it says He confides in those who fear Him. Sometimes we just need to have a good fear of the Holy God. That's a good thing. Because the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. So we know that kind of thing happens. Then notice the final attack that they launched at Nehemiah. When they could not get him alone to kill him, they planned to do the next thing, best thing. They wanted to discredit him. He had been hired to intimidate me so that I would commit a sin by doing this. For Nehemiah to have gone to that meeting, gone into the temple, and closed the door for his protection would have been a sin. I didn't say that. Nehemiah said that. And then they would give me a bad name, discredit me. Now, if these people couldn't kill him, perhaps they could simply destroy his reputation and be just as effective. If they could not get Nehemiah to go to the house of God and close the doors for protection, what would they do? Well, let's just discredit him. Because if he had gone... Think about what they would have said. They would have been saying, Nehemiah cares about you so much, he went into the temple and closed the door for you. He'd be saying, well, what about you and your kids? Your kids are not safe. Your kids are still out there building the wall, but not on Nehemiah, he's protecting himself. You see how they would have twisted that? So, I mean, it, it was crazy, but God gave him this wisdom. The people would begin to talk and damage his reputation, and they would spread rumors about him. Now, I wish I could tell you that the rumor mill died when Nehemiah died. But it did not. Now look, the rumor mill is alive and well at your school. It's alive and well at your company. It's alive and well at your church. It ought not be, but it is. If you hear about me, a rumor about me committing a sin, it's probably true. Did he say that? Yes, he did. <laughs> Just know that it's probably true. What I try to do is when I sin, not if I sin, but when I sin, I try to quickly confess my sins and get back in right fellowship with God because I do sin. If you knew what kind of sinner I was, you wouldn't allow me to be your pastor. And if I knew what kind of sinner you were, I wouldn't allow you to be my member. Right? We're all in this together is what I'm trying to say. Don't put anybody on the pedestal. We can all do it. So if you hear about it, it's probably true. But I want to confess him and I want to get back in fellowship with God. I want to love him and serve him. You see, it's about grace. It's about mercy. It's about forgiveness. Don't you like what Micah has to say? The Bible says, He has shown you, O oh man, what is good. What does the Lord require of you? 
Now this is simple. This is as simple as, as we're going to get it. Simple. What does God expect from you? Put your name in there. What does God expect from mine? To act justly, to love justice, and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with God. A simple plan that takes a lifetime to implement. To seek justice. I mean, to really care for the poor in our community, to seek justice for them. See, sometimes they don't get justice because they don't have enough money to hire an attorney. But we do. We have attorneys. So we get justice. So we have to seek justice. We have to love mercy. The thing for me to do would be to hit you back. But because I love mercy, I just want to say, no, I won't forgive you and everything's good. And to walk humbly before the Lord. Why do you think we have a altar, a family altar for a time? Do you think we just need to pray more? Well, yeah, that's true. But there's something about physically humbling yourself in front of people. It's a good thing. Why? Because it says to walk humbly with the Lord your God. Clearly, we know what to do. The Bible says a good name is to be desired more than gold. Americans don't believe that, but it is still true. Because for money, we will do just about anything. You know, it only takes a little while to make money, but it takes a lifetime to make a name for yourself. We were in a meeting one time here, and somebody had done some work for the church, and we were talking about getting them a check or something or another, and the person on the committee said, well, I don't know about any of that, but here's what I do know. He is the most honest man I have ever known. Now, wouldn't you like to have that as a reputation? The most honest man I've ever known? Yeah. Yeah, that's like top of the line, being truthful, being honest. It takes a lifetime to develop that. Today, we who are committed to God to be used to build a great church here on out Hilton Avenue know that we are going to face opposition. We are. That, that, that is no doubt about that. We hope it will not come, but the Bible says that it will. But even in the face of opposition, we must be faithful to complete the task God has given us. This past week, I was working in the library some, and I found something. It is the program for the organizational meeting, the very first meeting ever at Waldrop Memorial Baptist Church. And no, you can't have it. This is mine for all time. You should clean up the library. You can have it. <laughs> Hope you've got one. Original members, uh, Murray may have one. But I have one now. It's got the songs they sang. It's got who did what. It's got all the cool stuff in there about how the property was purchased and how people happened on it accidentally. They were looking at another property. And you know, when you look at that, you realize we have a task to complete. This is not done. There are people in Columbus still that don't know Jesus, right? There is a room full of children out there. Leslie, how many? Fifteen children and three workers in a room about a third the size of this room. So just be happy you're comfortable, okay? It is hot down there. It's not comfortable. But just know we've got a job to do. We're going to raise those children to know Jesus and serve Him. When Chris gets here, we're going to raise some teenagers to know Jesus and serve Him and soon put them on some committees when they get college and working. Amen? We're going to put them to work. This is a job. We have not finished this. My question to you today is are you going to help fulfill the call of God or are you going to ridicule those who do? You can't sit on the fence. Get in, get out. Get off, get on. Let me encourage you to get involved in fulfilling the call of God here on Hilton Avenue. Amen? Amen. Would you pray with me? As your heads are bowed, your eyes are closed. If you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, that is the first step. It's always the first step. I would love to lead you in a prayer that would introduce you to Him. It's not the end, it is the beginning. But if you pray in your heart, Father, forgive me. Jesus, save me. Holy Spirit, live in me. If you pray that prayer or a prayer like that, the Bible says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. We have that promise. And so now is the time of invitation. If you would like to come to the altar and commit yourself to fulfilling the call God's given us here, the altar is open. If you'd like to come and receive Christ, tell me you've done that. I'd love to rejoice with you.
Whatever you need to do to be in obedience to Him. Maybe it's to join our church. Come on, the doors are open. We welcome you. Let's stand together. Number 544.